Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 508, Gold Medal for the Use of Crutch goes to... This episode of Craftlit is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am well. I did a good this week. I managed to take a ripped couch where the upholstery seam had just separated and sew it back up. I did this once before. It came out again. This time I used some really heavy duty thread and tied the tightest tying that I could at the ends of the thread. If you have never had to repair uh, an upholstery seam rip, or if you've had to, but you didn't know what you're doing, I'm going to link out to a YouTube video that demonstrates it very, very nicely. It's excellent maybe that'll help you out if you're ever stuck in the same situation because it's kind of stinky if you have a big gaping hole in your couch. And aside from that, this last week, maybe week and a half, I have been spending my train trip into work by working on the sequel to Grounded. I have rewritten this book so many times it is just not even funny, but I think I've got it now. And I'm very happy. I've finished the first seven chapters. I'm very happy with the the way it's going this time. So fingers are crossed that I will finally be able to be productive. It's much easier to write when you're not driving. I'm just saying. So yay for trains. It's a happy thing. Almost, not quite, but almost as happy as someone is going to be in the second of two chapters that we will listen to today. Our first chapter, chapter 14, The First Blow, gives you a pretty good idea that something's going to happen. And and Robert Louis Stevenson does an incredible job in these chapters of leaving you hanging, that he, he is the master of cliffhangers. And I've been reading some essays on him. And next week, we may only get through one chapter because that chapter is loaded with all sorts of information. And background information about RLS that just flows through. It's, it's cool. But that's not to say that today's chapters are chop liver. I'm just saying. It's pretty good. So there are some terms that get used kind of archaically in our chapters today. And then there are some terms that I just had no idea about and had to go look up. Uh, the first one that was kind of odd is the use of the word ambush. and I don't know why, but it struck me as odd the way that the the term was being used, because I think of an ambush as a as a verb that it is a surprise attack that comes out of a concealed position. The way it gets used in today's chapter is more like a place from which you would surprise attack, and I think it I think that particular version of it goes way back, like. Middle English back. So it's it's not a huge surprise that it's getting used that way. It's just, it was kind of jarring to me. Uh, and I didn't know if it'd be jarring to you, but that's the deal. If it is, that's all that's going on. And then there's the term snipe, which we have come across before. There are snipe hunts, there are snipe in several of the books that we've read. And just to remind you, they are birds, they are waterfowl. And as such, They have long legs and kind of thin necks. So that will make more sense when you hear it used in the chapter. Our second chapter today, chapter 15, we learn a whole lot about Long John in chapter 14. If you recall, young Jim had just scooted off onto one of the little dinghies and went ashore with the pirates and then ran off. So Jim has a chance to explore the island and also a chance to get away from the pirates. 
Then we get to chapter 15, and there is some interesting use of language going on in chapter 15 for very, very specific character building reasons. So I'm going to give you refreshers for some terms and brand new information for some other ones. Quartermaster. On a pirate ship, the quartermaster was really like the first mate, like the second in command. The quartermaster also did things like being in charge of the supplies, the, the food, the rations, the payouts. So if you go and you pirate away and you get a lot of loot, the quartermaster was the one who was trusted to divvy up the loot appropriately. So quartermaster, kind of an important job on a pirate ship. Before the mast, we've heard this several times so far, that's just a, a common sailor. That's just your everyday sailor who is um, not becoming or has not crossed that line and become an officer like a quartermaster. Masthead. The masthead, as you may recall, is the very top of the tallest mast on a ship. Why does that matter? Because in this chapter, mastheaded gets used as a verb. If you masthead somebody, you tell them, usually as a punishment, to go up to the top of that mast. So you're mastheading them. So that's just punishing something or, or keeping someone away from everybody else by sending them up somewhere very high. You will hear a phrase, loops of tarry gaskin. You may recall that we had tarry pigtails earlier because that's a great way to stop your hair from coming out of its braid. <laughs> It's a great way to stop it from coming out of its braid forever. A gaskin was kind of like the, you've probably seen them in old paintings and pictures. They're kind of like a gaiter that goes over that stretch between where your shoe would end. So it goes over the top of your shoe and up your leg so that the, the gap between your britches and your shoe would be covered. This is especially useful if you don't have boots. So. Tarry gaskin would be a, a gaiter that you had put tar onto to make it waterproof-ish, or at least watertight. Certainly, if you this is the problem we've talked about before with oil cloth. If you sew through the tarry part after the tar has been applied, you're putting a hole into the tarry part, and that would give water a point of ingress to get you wet. So, not sure how this tarry gaskin was constructed but at least it gives you an idea. Saying something is going to be a certain amount of weight by the stone. This is, you may have heard, folks in the UK who not just have access to the metric system in their brains, but also have access to a different weight system where a stone is about 14 pounds. So if you get a stone of something, you're getting about 14 pounds of something. So that's kind of cool. Chucking farthings, chuck farthings, or... Penny pitching, pitching pennies. These are gambling games that still get played, to be completely honest. But the whole idea is that you have a some kind of a backstop, whether it's a wall, a low wall that you could sit on, or the wall, the external wall of a building, whatever, as long as it's tall enough that you could toss coins at it, farthings or pennies. And the goal is to get your coin closest to that particular barrier. So if it's a, a sitting wall, you are trying to get your penny to drop closest to the sitting wall. Whoever does gets all the coins. So you're going to hear a reference to chuck farthings and using a very interesting location as the backstop upon which to pitch the coins. Clove hitch. We will talk a little bit more about the clove hitch afterwards, but before before we get to that point, just a reminder for anybody who isn't into tying knots, and, and I know plenty of people are into tying knots, so if you are not among them, the lucky few, a clove hitch is a very specific kind of hitching knot. You may have heard in Wild West movies or stories about hitching posts. This is because you have the horse, you have a harness on the horse of some sort, a bridle or a rope harness. And you have a post that you can hitch your horse to. Any kind of a knot that ties a rope or long, thin substance to a pole of some sort is going to be a hitch. There are several different kinds of hitch knots. Now, there are other knots that are used for tying two ropes together or, or bringing two things together 
and that knot is the the join. Clove hitch is not that kind of knot. It has to go around something. So the pole is in the clove hitch. Just keep that in mind. The pole is the thing that's in the clove hitch. I also linked out to a video on how to tie a clove hitch knot, just in case you were interested in learning how to tie one. It's kind of it's kind of an interesting knot when you see it tied. Past tense is already done. You kind of look at it and go, well, yeah, what's so special about that? But as you watch it being created, it's kind of cool. So I think that's all of the kind of odd language that you are going to need as we move into these two very exciting chapters. And the, the end of chapter 15 is the end of a section. So the next section will begin next week. But first, here we go with chapters 14 and 15 of Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. Here we go. Chapter 14. The First Blow I was so pleased at having given the slip to Long John that I began to enjoy myself and look around me with some interest on the strange land that I was in. I had crossed a marshy tract full of willows, bulrushes, and odd, outlandish, swampy trees, and now had come out upon the skirts of an open piece of undulating, sandy country, about a mile long, dotted with a few pines, and a great number of contorted trees, not unlike the oak in growth, but pale in the foliage, like willows. On the far side of the open stood one of the hills, with two quaint, craggy peaks shining vividly in the sun. I now felt for the first time the joy of exploration— the isle was uninhabited, but my shipmates I have left behind, and nothing lived in front of me but dumb brutes and fowls. I turned hither and thither among the trees. Here and there were flowering plants unknown to me. Here and there I saw snakes, and one raised his head from a ledge of rock and hissed at me with a noise not unlike the spinning of a top. Little did I suppose that he was a deadly enemy, and the noise was the famous rattle." Then I came to a long thicket of these oak-like trees, live or evergreen oaks I heard afterward they should be called, which grew low along the sand like brambles, the boughs curiously twisted, the foliage compact like thatch. The thicket stretched down from the top of one of the sandy knolls, spreading and growing taller as it went, until it reached the margin of the broad reedy fen through which the nearest of the little rivers soaked its way into the anchorage. The marsh was streaming in the strong sun, and the outline of the spyglass trembled through the haze. All at once there began to go a sort of bustle among the bulrushes. A wild duck flew up with a quack, another followed, and soon over the whole surface of the marsh a great cloud of birds hung screaming and circling in the air. I judged at once that some of my shipmates must be drawing near along the borders of the fen. Nor was I deceived, for soon I heard the very distant and low tones of a human voice, which, as I continued to give ear, grew steadily louder and nearer. This put me in great fear, and I crawled under cover of the nearest live oak, and squatted there, hearkening, as silent as a mouse. Another voice answered, and then the first voice, which I now recognized to be Silver's, once more took up the story, and ran on for a long while in a stream, only now and again interrupted by the other. By the sound they must have been talking earnestly, and almost fiercely, but no distinct word came to my hearing. At last the speakers seemed to have paused, and perhaps to have sat down, for not only did they cease to draw any nearer, but the birds themselves began to grow more quiet, and to settle again into their places in the swamp. And now I began to feel that I was neglecting my business. That since I had been so foolhardy as to come ashore with these desperadoes, the least I could do was to overhear them at their councils, and that my plain and obvious duty was to draw as close as I could manage under the favourable ambush of the crouching trees. I could tell the direction of the speakers pretty exactly, not only by the sound of their voices, but by the behaviour of the few birds that still hung in alarm above the heads of the intruders. 
crawling on all fours, I made steadily but slowly towards them, till at last, raising my head to an aperture among the leaves, I could see clear down into a little green dell beside the marsh, and closely set about with trees, where Long John Silver and another of the crew stood face to face in conversation. The sun beat full upon them. Silver had thrown his hat beside him on the ground, and his great smooth blond face, all shining with heat, was lifted to the other man's in a kind of appeal. Mate, he was saying, that's because I thinks gold dust of you, gold dust, and you may lay to that, and if I hadn't took to you like pitch, do you think I'd have been here a warning of you? All's up. You can't make no mend. It's to save your neck that I must speak in. And if one of the wild uns knew it, where'd I be, Tom? Now tell me, where'd I be? Silver, said the other man, and I observed he was not only red in the face, but spoke as hoarse as a crow, and his voice shook too like a taut rope. Silver, says he, you're old and you're honest, or has the name of it. And you've money, too, which lots of poor sailors hasn't. And you're brave, or I'm mistook. And will you tell me you'll let yourself be led away with that kind of a mess of swabs? Not you. As sure as God sees me, I'd sooner lose my hand. If I turn again my duty— And then, all of a sudden, he was interrupted by a noise. I'd found one of the honest hands. Well, here at that same moment— came news of another. Far away out in the marsh there arose all of a sudden a sound like the cry of anger, then another on the back of it, and then one horrid, long-drawn scream. The rocks of the spyglass re-echoed it a score of times. The whole troop of marsh-birds rose again, darkening heaven with a simultaneous whirr and long after that death-yell was still ringing in my brain, silence had re-established its empire, and only the rustle of the redescending birds and the boom of the distant surges disturbed the languor of the afternoon. Tom had leapt at the sound, like a horse at the spur, but Silver had not winked an eye. He stood where he was, resting lightly on his crutch, watching his companion like a snake about to spring. "'John!' said the sailor, stretching out his hand. "'Hands off!' cried Silver, leaping back a yard, as it seemed to me, with the speed and security of a trained gymnast. "'Hands off, if you like, John Silver,' said the other. "'It's a black conscience that can make you fear of me, but in heaven's name tell me what was that?' "'That?' returned Silver, smiling away, but warier than ever his eye a mere pinpoint in his big face, but gleaming like a crumb of glass. "'That? Oh, I reckon that would be Alan!' And at this poor Tom flashed out like a hero. "'Alan!' he cried. "'Then rest his soul for a true seaman. And as for you, John Silver, long you've been a mate of mine, but you're a mate of mine no longer. If I die like a dog, I'll die in my duty. You've "'Killed Alan, have you? Kill me too if you can, but I defies you.' And with that this brave fellow turned his back directly on the cook, and set off walking for the beach. But he was not destined to go far. With a cry John seized the branch of a tree, whipped the crutch out of his armpit, and sent that uncouth missile hurling through the air. It struck poor Tom point foremost, and with stunning violence, right between the shoulders in the middle of his back. His hands flew up, and he gave a sort of gasp and fell. Whether he was injured much or little, none could ever tell. Like enough, to judge from the sound, his back was broken on the spot. But he had no time given him to recover. Silver, agile as a monkey, even without leg or crutch, was on the top of him next moment, and had twice buried his knife up to the hilt in that defenceless body. From my place of ambush I could hear him pant aloud as he struck the blows. I do not know what it rightly is to faint, 
but I do know that for the next little while the whole world swam away from before me in a whirling mist. Silver and the birds and the tall spy-glass hilltop going round and round and topsy-turvy before my eyes, and all manner of bells ringing and distant voices shouting in my ear. When I came again to myself the monster had pulled himself together, his crutch under his arm, his hat upon his head. Just before him Tom lay motionless upon the sward, but the murderer minded him not a whit, cleansing his blood-stained knife the while upon a wisp of grass. Everything else was unchanged, the sun still shining mercilessly upon the steaming marsh, and the tall pinnacle of the mountain, and I could scarcely persuade myself that the murder had actually been done, and a human life cruelly cut short a moment since before my eyes. And now John put his hand into his pocket, brought out a whistle, and blew upon it several modulated blasts that rang far across the heated air. I could not tell, of course, the meaning of the signal, but it instantly awoke my fears. More men would be coming. I might be discovered. They had already slain two of the honest people. After Tom and Alan, might not I come next? Instantly I began to extricate myself, and crawl back again, with what speed and silence I could manage, to the more open portion of the wood. And as I did so I could hear hails coming and going between the old buccaneer and his comrades, and this sound of danger lent me wings. As soon as I was clear of the thicket I ran as I never ran before, scarce minding the direction of my flight, so long as it led me from the murderers, and as I ran fear grew and grew upon me, until it turned into a kind of frenzy. Indeed, could any one be more entirely lost than I? When the gun fired, how should I dare to go down to the boats among those fiends, still smoking from their crime? Would not the first of them who saw me wring my neck like a snipe's? Would not my absence itself be an evidence to them of my alarm, and therefore of my fatal knowledge? It was all over, I thought. Good-bye to the Hispaniola, good-bye to the squire, the doctor, and the captain. There was nothing left for me but death by starvation, or death by the hands of the mutineers. All this while, as I say, I was still running, and without taking any notice I had drawn near to the foot of the little hill with the two peaks, and had got into a part of the island where the wild oaks grew more widely apart, and seemed more like forest trees in their bearing and dimensions. Mingled with these there were a few scattered pines, some fifty, some nearer seventy feet high. The air, too, smelled more fresh than down beside the marsh and here a fresh alarm brought me to a standstill with a thumping heart. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 The Man of the Island From the side of the hill, which was here steep and stony, a spout of gravel was dislodged, and fell rattling and bounding through the trees. My eyes turned instinctively in that direction, and I saw a figure leap with great rapidity behind the trunk of a pine. What it was, whether bear, or man, or monkey, I could in no wise tell. It seemed dark and shaggy, more I knew not, but the terror of this new apparition brought me to a stand. I was now, it seemed, cut off upon both sides, behind me the murderers, before me this lurking nondescript, and immediately I began to prefer the dangers that I knew to those I knew not. Silver himself appeared less terrible in contrast with this creature of the woods, and I turned on my heel, and looking sharply behind me over my shoulder, began to retrace my steps in the direction of the boats. Instantly the figure reappeared, and, making a wide circuit, began to head me off. I was tired, at any rate, but had I been as fresh as when I rose, I could see it was in vain for me to contend in speed with such an adversary. 
From trunk to trunk the creature flitted like a deer, running man-like on two legs, but unlike any man that I had ever seen, stooping almost double as it ran. Yet a man it was. I could no longer be in doubt about that. I began to recall what I had heard of cannibals. I was with an ace of calling for help, but the mere fact that he was a man, however wild, had somewhat reassured me, and my fear of silver began to revive in proportion. I stood still, therefore, and cast about for some method of escape, and as I was so thinking the recollection of my pistol flashed into my mind. As soon as I remembered I was not defenceless, courage glowed again in my heart, and I set my face resolutely for this man of the island, and walked briskly toward him. He was concealed by this time behind another tree-trunk, but he must have been watching me closely, for as soon as I began to move in his direction he reappeared and took a step to meet me. Then he hesitated, drew back, came forward again, and at last, to my wonder and confusion, threw himself on his knees and held out his clasped hands in supplication. At that I once more stopped. "'Who are you?' I asked. "'Ben Gunn,' he answered, and his voice sounded hoarse and awkward, like a rusty lock. "'I'm poor Ben Gunn, I am, and I haven't spoke with a Christian these three years.' I could now see that he was a white man like myself, and that his features were even pleasing. His skin, wherever it was exposed, was burned by the sun. Even his lips were black, and his fair eyes looked quite startling in so dark a face. Of all the beggar men that I had seen or fancied, he was the chief for raggedness. He was clothed with tatters of old ship's canvas and old sea-cloth, and this extraordinary patchwork was all held together by a system of the most various and incongruous fastenings, brass buttons, bits of stick, and loops of tarry gaskin. About his waist he wore an old brass-buckled leather belt, which was the one thing solid in his old accoutrement. Three years?' I cried. "'Were you shipwrecked?' "'Nay, mate,' said he, "'marooned.' I had heard that word, and I knew it stood for a horrible kind of punishment, common enough among the buccaneers, in which the offender is put ashore with a little powder and shot, and left behind on some desolate and distant island. "'Marooned three years agone,' he continued, "'and lived on goats since then, and berries and oysters. Wherever a man is, says I, a man can do for himself. But, mate, my heart is sore for Christian diet. You mayn't happen to have a piece of cheese about you now. No, well, many's the long night I've dreamed of cheese, toasted mostly, and woke up again, and here I were. If ever I can get aboard again, said I, you shall have cheese by the stone. At this time he had been feeling the stuff of my jacket, smoothing my hands, looking at my boots, and generally in the intervals of his speech showing a childish pleasure in the presence of a fellow-creature. But at my last words he perked up into a kind of startled slyness. "'If ever you get aboard again, says you,' he repeated, "'why now, who's to hinder you?' "'Not you, I know,' was my reply. "'Oh, and right you was!' he cried. "'Now you, what do you call yourself, mate?' "'Jim,' I told him. "'Jim, Jim,' says he, quite pleased, apparently. "'Well, now, Jim, I've lived that rough as you'd be ashamed to hear of. Now, for instance, you wouldn't think I had had a pious mother to look at me?' he asked. "'Why, uh, no, not in particular,' I answered. "'Ah, well,' said he, "'but I had remarkably pious, "'and I was a civil pious boy, "'and could rattle off my catechism that fast "'you couldn't tell one word from another. "'And here's what it come to, Jim, "'and it begun with Chuck Farthen on the blessed gravestones. "'That's what it begun with.' 
and it went farther than that, and so my mother told me and predicted the whole she did, the pious woman. But it were a providence that put me here. I've thought it all out in this here lonely island, and I'm back on piety. You can't catch me tasting rum so much, but just a thimbleful for luck, of course, the first chance I have. I'm bound I'll be good, and I see the way to. And Jim, looking all round him and lowering his voice to a whisper, I'm rich. I now felt sure that the poor fellow had gone crazy in his solitude, and I suppose I must have shown the feeling in my face, for he repeated the statement hotly. Rich, rich, I says, and I'll tell you what, I'll make a man of you, Jim. Ah, Jim, you'll bless your stars, you will. You was the first that found me. And at this there came suddenly a lowering shadow over his face, and he tightened his grasp upon my hand, and raised a forefinger threateningly before my eyes. "'Now, Jim, you tell me true. That ain't Flint's ship?' he asked. At this I had a happy inspiration. I began to believe that I had found an ally, and I answered him at once. "'It's not Flint's ship, and Flint is dead. But I'll tell you true, but I'll tell you true, as you ask me. There are some of Flint's hands aboard. Worst luck for the rest of us. "'Not a man with one leg,' he gasped. "'Silver?' I asked. "'Ah, oh, Silver,' says he. "'That were his name. He's the cook, and the ringleader, too.' He was still holding me by the wrist, and at that he gave it quite a ring. "'If you was sent by Long John,' he said, "'I'm as good as pork, and I know it. "'But where was you, do you suppose?' I had made up my mind in a moment, and by way of answer told him the whole story of our voyage and the predicament in which we found ourselves. He heard me with the keenest interest, and when I had done he patted me on the head. "'You're a good lad, Jim,' he said. "'And you're all in a clove hitch, ain't you? "'Well, you just put your trust in Ben Gunn. "'Ben Gunn's the man to do it. "'Would you think it likely now "'that your squire would prove a liberal-minded one in case of help, "'him being in a clove hitch, as you remark?' "'I told him the squire was the most liberal of men.' "'Ah, but you see,' returned Ben Gunn, I didn't mean giving me a gate to keep, and a suit of livery clothes, and such. That's not my mark, Jim. What I mean is, would he be likely to come down to the tune of, say, one thousand pounds out of money that's as good as a man's own already? I'm sure he would, said I. As it is, all hands were to share. And a passage home? he added, with a look of great shrewdness. "'Why,' I cried, "'the squire's a gentleman, and besides, if we got rid of the others, we should want you to help work the vessel home.' "'Oh,' said he, "'so you would,' and he seemed very much relieved. "'Now, I'll tell you what,' he went on, "'so much I'll tell you and no more. I were in Flint's ship when he buried the treasure, he and six along, six strong seamen. They was ashore nigh on a week, and us standing off and on in the old walrus. One fine day up went the signal, and here come Flint by himself in a little boat, and his head done up in a blue scarf. The sun was getting up, and mortal white he looked about the cutwater. But there he was, you mind, and the six all dead, dead and buried. How had he done it? Not a man a baldest could make out. It was battle, murder, and sudden death, leastways, him against six. Billy Bones was the mate, Long Johnny was quartermaster, and they asked him where the treasure was. "'Ah,' he says, "'you can go ashore if you like and stay,' he says. "'But as for the ship, 
she'll be up for more by thunder that's what he said well i was in another ship three years back and we sighted this island boys said i here's flint's treasure let's land and find it the captain was displeased at that but my messmates were all of a mind and landed twelve days they looked for it and every day they had the worst word for me until one fine morning all hands went aboard as for you benjamin gunn says they here's a musket they says and a spade and a pickaxe you can stay here and find flint's money for yourself they says well jim three years have i been here and not a bite of christian diet from that day to this but now you look here look at me do i look like a man before the mast no says you nor i weren't neither i says and with that he winked and pinched me hard just you mention them words to your squire jim he went on nor he weren't neither that's the words three years he were the man of this island light and dark fair and rain and sometimes he would maybe think upon a prayer says you and sometimes he would maybe think of his old mother so be as she's alive you'll say but the most part of gun's time this is what you'll say the most part of his time was took up with another matter and then you'll give him a nip like i do and he pinched me again in the most confidential manner then he continued then you'll up and you'll say this gun is a good man you'll say and he puts a precious sight more confidence a precious sight mind that in a gentleman born than in these gentlemen of fortune having been one hisself well i said i don't understand one word that you've been saying but that's neither here nor there for how am i to get on board ah said he that's the hitch for sure well there's my boat that i made with my two hands i keep her under the white rock if the worst come to the worst we might try that after dark hi he broke out what's that for just then although the sun had still an hour or two to run all the echoes of the island awoke and bellowed to the thunder of a cannon they have begun to fight i cried follow me and i began to run toward the anchorage my terrors all forgotten while close at my side the marooned man in his goatskins trotted easily and lightly left left says he keep to your left hand mate jim under the trees with you that's where i killed my first goat they don't come down here now they're all mast-headed on them mountains for the fear of benjamin gunn ah and there's the cemetery cemetery he must have meant you see the mounds i come here and prayed nows and thens when i thought maybe a sunday would be about do it weren't quite a chapel but it seemed more solemn like and then says you ben gunn was short-handed no chaplain nor so much as a bible and a flag says you so he kept talking as i ran neither expecting nor receiving any answer the cannon shot was followed after a considerable interval by a volley of small arms another pause and then not a quarter of a mile in front of me I beheld the Union Jack flutter in the air above a wood. End of chapter 15 Right. So, the Union Jack is flying on the island. On the island. That is interesting. That is interesting because the chances of the pirates having put up a Union Jack it's long odds, I would say, that the pirates would do that. There's also been gunfire. We don't know from whence. We can make guesses. We know that there are guns on board the Hispaniola, 
with our our six men trying to preserve themselves in the face of six other men who may or may not be pirates. We know that there's at least one big gun on the ship, and there are other rifles and, and pistols and guns like that. We know that the pirates, do we know that they're armed? Did we think they were armed? I think we thought they were armed. Some of them may have been queerly armed. Anyway, chances are pirates on shore also have guns. So lots of people could be shooting. But someone got somewhere and raised a flag, which is kind of interesting because my first thought was, oh, well, that just must be where Ben Gunn lives. But no, because number one, he wouldn't have a Union Jack that was in any shape, maybe even to be able to recognize it as a British flag. Uh, But also, he was a pirate too. His ship, the Walrus, was not the ship he was on with Flint. He and Long John and Flint were... In a previous voyage, several years later, Ben Gunn wound up on a ship, the Walrus. He'd been telling everybody about Flint's treasure. They stayed 12 days to look for the treasure, and then they marooned him for not being able to find the treasure, which I think is kind of stinky on their part. Not that I give pirates a whole lot of credit generally for sound thinking, although the more I learn about piracy at this time, the more it starts to make sense why some people were doing that. Yeah, so it's interesting. And no longer surprises me that some very bright people, like Lon John, are involved in piracy. Speaking of Long John, let's go back to chapter 14. Holy cow! So now you understand the name of this episode. Because that is an extraordinary shot. When Long John wings his crutch at poor Tom and breaks his back with it, between the shoulder blades, no less. I mean, wow, that's really scary. And then scarier still is Long John hopping over there and jumping down on Tom and perforating him. That is just as unnerving, I think, as him being so calm afterwards. Just, you know cleaning off the knife. Ain't no thing. That says an awful lot about Silver. I also thought, before he was perforated, that Tom said some interesting things about Silver as well. You're old and you're honest, or at least you have a name for it. So Long John was probably known even by the sailors that Trelawney had picked. People probably knew that he had done some piracy in his time because these are sailor people. They are around wharfs and points of entry and water and news travels. So my guess is that wasn't a surprise. What I thought was a surprise is that along with the, oh yeah, he's a pirate part, is the, oh yeah, and he's really honest part. This is where Long John Silver becomes a really, really interesting character, because that's not what I would have expected. But again, he was quartermaster with Flint, which means Flint trusted him to divvy up the loot, as well as pay the men fairly and honestly, and procure supplies, and run the whole place, and take over the ship if Flint, for whatever reason, was incapacitated and couldn't run the ship anymore. Long John Mm. He is fun to look at because he keeps you keep learning more and more about this guy. So there's that part. There's poor Tom and his further explanation or or uh, plea with Silver of you're old, you're honest. The guys look up to you. You have money and a lot of poor sailors don't. So part of Tom's argument seems to be, why are you doing this crazy, ridiculous thing? It makes sense for these young guys who've got nothing to do it. But why would you risk everything going up against Smollett and Livesey and, oh, I don't know, the law in order to chase a treasure which you would have gotten a part of anyway? So what's the deal, yo? So poor Alan, poor Tom, poor Jim, who had to witness that, which really stinks. And then goes charging off into the fort. Well, he doesn't go charging off because that would be stupid. He backs out of there as quickly as he can. And then when he's far enough away not to make 
a huge amount of noise, then he runs. Into Ben Gunn. One of the more interesting characters, just in general, because there's there's a lot about him that seems to be drawing on kind of Robinson Crusoe tropes, things like that. But he's also pretty unique and very specific about things. We know what he's been eating. We know the food that he wants more than anything. Some toasted cheese. We understand how he is clothed. We understand that he has made his own boat, which I imagine is more like a canoe or raft kind of thing. But still, that's pretty impressive. It also means there haven't been any ships coming close enough to the island in these last three years for him to scoot out on that thing and try and flag them down. So he has been really alone. And you can tell that he has been talking to himself for a while because when they're running and he is not out of breath and he is just blathering on between directions, left, left, keep to your left hand, mate, or blathering on about the goats being mastheaded up on the sh- on the the spyglass because they're afraid to come down from the quote-unquote top of the mast because he's down there and he's going to eat them. The sedimary instead of cemetery. Pointing it out seems to be his way of really proving to young Jim that he has regained his pious ways. His mother would be proud of him because he has no church. He has no priest. He has no where to go to show his religious turn. So instead, he goes to the graveyard and prays among the dead, which I actually think is really, really beautiful. But then I also started to get kind of creeped out because who are they? I don't think they're the goat bodies. So were these guys who'd been killed by Flint and left on the island? And he found what was left of them and, you know, for years later, what was left of them and buried them or people who washed up on shore. I have no idea. Maybe we'll find out. But for now, it's his way of saying, see, I, I am part of society again. I, I can be a good guy. I'm worth bringing back with you, as if the promise of treasure wasn't enough. I also thought his, his running monologue to Jim of how is Squire Trelawney going to deal with me? Is he going to be fair? Is he, is he going to understand that I'm worth the risk, that I am not a threat, that I understand the error of my ways and I'm going to do everything I can to prove that to him. And Jim's judgment of character on this one, as opposed to Long John, seems to be pretty good. Once he knew that there was a chance that Ben Gunn was not a friend of Long John Silver, uh, I think Jim went into the an enemy of my enemy is my friend thing. And, uh, and so far, Ben Gunn's been helpful. He's getting Jim out of a mess load of trouble and presumably down to his little boat so they can beat it out of there. But for now, we've been stopped by the Union Jack, <laughs> which, is, which is an interesting way to get stopped. So for me, take care. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what you heard, Please leave us a review at iTunes or like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter or any one of a million different places that Craftlet wound up over the last 13 years. For more information on Craftlet, you can visit craftlit.com and subscribe via your favorite podcast app or download the Craftlet app so you can get all of your episodes right there in your hand, all in one place without having to hassle with anything else. So you can be sure not to miss any of Treasure Island. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. Thanks. Thanks.